from the Thebaid of Egypt to the caves and cells of Mount Athos, and even beyond to the vast forests of northern Russia. These are the chronicles of the desert. Not all deserts are barren wastelands, such as those found in Egypt. Nor are the desert fathers just figures from the ancient past, whose stories we remember, yet consider unlikely in our own time. For even today, certain men and women have forsaken the world and fled to deserts of varying degrees in order to seek God. One such desert is located on Mount Athos, the monastic republic situated in northeastern Greece. The Athenite Desert, as it is called, is found at the southern end of the peninsula and is known for its seclusion, rough landscape, and harsh climate. Many monks and hermits have labored there in caves and skeets, and some have even been declared saints. Such are the three modern-day monastics added to the church calendar by the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate on March 9, 2020. Elder Joseph the Hesychast and Elders Daniel and Ephraim of Katunakia all lived remarkably ascetic lives, hidden away from the modern world. And yet, the fruit of their hesychastic way of life has enriched not only the holy mountain, but all of the Orthodox world, and even Orthodoxy in North America in a very direct way. This is due in large part to the practice of spiritual fatherhood, foreshadowed in the New Testament and exemplified by the Desert Fathers, where a young monk lives in obedience to a spiritual father and elder, Yeron in Greek, and Staric in Slavonic, and is led from purification toward union with God, and may, in time and with experience, be able to transmit this tradition to others. Elder Daniel, the oldest of these new saints, was born in 1846 and labored for most of his life in silence and asceticism in Katunakia. It's now a group of cells in the Athenite desert, so named for the cloaks left behind by the Egyptian monks who moved there long ago to practice asceticism. They were warned that the climate was much colder and the humidity much higher in the Athenite desert compared to Egypt. But they didn't listen and died soon after. The cloaks which remained are called Katuni in Greek, with the area being given the name Katunakia, which comes from the plural diminutive meaning the small cloaks. Elder Daniel came to Mount Athos after graduating from the renowned theological academy in Smyrna and at the direction of St. Arsenios of Paros. He first lived at the monastery of St. Pandeleimon before moving to Vadopedi Monastery for five years. He then withdrew into the desert in order to seek greater external silence so that he could practice the prayer of the heart while struggling to reach interior silence. In time, Daniel attained stillness or Hezekia and realized that others wanted to learn from him. So, he formed a brotherhood and began guiding monks through the study of Holy Scripture and the Philokalia, working also from his own experience and using words that sprang from an illumination of grace. He became known for his great virtue strong prayer, and a remarkable discernment by which he helped many monks and laymen through difficult trials and temptations. He also shared this wisdom through many letters, including an ongoing correspondence with Saint Nectarios of Egina and Elder Philotheos Zervakos. In 1921, a 24-year-old layman from Paros named Francis stayed with the Brotherhood 
and in a short time, Elder Daniel discerned the young man's incredible zeal for God and inclination towards asceticism. This elder advised Francis to find a companion in a cave where he could practice his more austere asceticism in solitude. Francis found a companion in Father Arsenios, a monk from Asia Minor who had most recently lived in a monastery in the Holy Land. Together, the two labored in strict asceticism for three years. Francis, who would later be known as Elder Joseph the Hesychast, had realized in his late teens a strong desire to become a monk. He found Elder Daniel after journeying to the Holy Mountain and meeting with numerous ascetics in his search for someone to teach him the way of watchfulness and prayer of the heart. Three years after Elder Daniel had sent Francis off to find a cave, he recognized the young ascetic's commitment and placed him with Father Arsenios in obedience under two elders. Francis was tonsured a monk with the name Joseph after having received great benefit from the tradition of spiritual fatherhood. In 1929, Elder Daniel died, and so did the last of Joseph's two elders. Joseph wanted to live in greater silence, but soon gained a reputation as a grace-filled teacher, able to transmit to others the hesychastic way of life. Several monks came to join him, and so he formed a small brotherhood. But Elder Joseph was an austere and strict ascetic, and not many could remain with him long. Those few who did stay were able to learn from him and transmit this grace and teaching to others. Such a one was Ephraim of Katunakya a priest monk who served under a different elder, but was given permission to also learn spiritually from Elder Joseph whenever he visited the Brotherhood. Papa Ephrem, as he was known, often served the Divine Liturgy for Elder Joseph's Brotherhood at St. Basil's Skeet, and later at the Chapel of St. John the Forerunner at the small Skeet of St. Anne. Papa Ephrem was born in Thebes, Greece in 1912 and journeyed to the Holy Mountain in 1933. He lived in obedience to a very strict elder for 38 years and through this found much grace. But through Elder Joseph, Papa Ephrem learned how to cultivate the prayer of the heart, how to keep watch over his thoughts and senses and how to follow a path that leads to the purification of the heart and divine illumination. By 1980, Papa Ephrem had formed his own brotherhood. He also became worthy of countless gifts, including clairvoyance, foreknowledge, and discernment. But he always remembered Elder Joseph as his guide, saying, Elder Joseph was a spiritual giant and teacher of noetic prayer, taught by God. His love for our dear Panagia was unmatched. For her sake, he patiently endured everything, and it was from her that he received the great charism of the prayer of the heart. His pure heart said the prayer without ceasing, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. These three saints continued the tradition of spiritual fatherhood, both directly and indirectly, in a way that is reminiscent of the ancient desert fathers of the fourth century. Elder Joseph learned first from Elder Daniel and other ascetics, but also benefited from his own experience, and was even taught directly by God. He shared this grace and knowledge with his spiritual sons, which in turn led in large part to a renewal on Mount Athos after his death in 1959. Joseph of Vatopedi 
one of the elders' spiritual sons later commented, The elders' immense impetus brought back to the Athenite environment the true meaning and continuation of the theology of St. Gregory Palamas. His spiritual sons, men like the aforementioned Elder Joseph of Vatopedi, Elder Haralambos of Dionysiu, and Elder Ephrem of Philotheu, went on to reinvigorate the spiritual life in numerous monasteries on Mount Athos and throughout Greece. Even the Orthodox Church in North America has a connection to Elder Joseph. In 1979, his spiritual son, Elder Ephraim of Philotheu, visited the United States and Canada and saw firsthand how the Church in North America lacked the support of Orthodox monasticism which is traditionally the heart of Orthodox spirituality and keeper of her traditions. He gathered support from many faithful and between 1989 and 2004 established 17 Athenite-style monasteries in North America, all of which remain active today and can trace their heritage back to Elder Joseph. In times of uncertainty, it is often good to look to those who have endured trials and afflictions for guidance and inspiration. In the Orthodox Church, we turn to the lives of the saints. Men and women, like these three new saints, who lived God-pleasing lives and were sanctified by His grace. They offer us stories about the unrelenting search and love for Christ from which we can draw lessons on how to live the life of a Christian. Perhaps for us, not in the literal wilderness, but as best as we are able, given our own circumstances and even in very trying times. With the next three episodes of the Chronicles of the Desert, we will share stories and accounts from each of their lives. We hope that with this, you will find inspiration on your own journey.